any person, any scholar, sister, says anything, ask for proof. Allah says in Surah Baqarah chapter 2 verse 111, قُلْ حَاتُ بُنَانَكُمْ Produce your proof in kuntum sadiqin but if you're truthful. Any scholar, therefore what I say that what Dr. Zakir Naik says in Islam is zero. No value. What Allah says carry weight. Yeah, Salaam Alaikum ladies and gentlemen. Peace be upon you all. Um, sorry for the delay because there was uh, some hitches here, one or two I have to fix concerning the the network. Uh, and then thanks to God I'm, I'm here finally. Yeah. Uh, I seek refuge with Allah against the accursed devil. وَمَنْ أَحْسَنَ قَوْلًا مِمَّنْ دَعَا إِلَى اللَّهِ وَعَمِلَ سَالِحًا وَقَالَ إِنَّ لِي مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ Aha, so peace be upon you all. Uh, today, we are here to, to, to have a discussion concerning the misconceptions the Sunnis and the Hadithians have. Uh, when I say this, this is a mainstream issue we face daily in our daily lives. Because uh, the friends around us, whether we can call it friends, you can call it enemies, you will have the Sunnis, the Shiites, the, that's the Shiites, uh, you have the Ahmadiyyas, the Qadiriyas, the whatever dia dia you have. We have Christians, we have Jews, we have, uh, out of the Christians, we have the Ro Romans, we have the Pentecost, the Methodists, the Octodos, so, so many have you. So... When I say the misconceptions of the Sunnis, uh, you as as a as a layman or you as an ordinary person, you have to find your way around these people because these are the, your, the daily hurdles you have to be facing and challenges you have to be facing with such a people. So, I'm here to get to give out some tips on how to deal with some of their interactions with you and how, uh, if you are not careful, they can raise their animosity between you and them and is easily with enmity and they can hate you for just telling them the truth or questioning what their beliefs so for a logical assessment of a religion instead of telling somebody they are wrong or they are right you don't need to do that what you need to do is just ask them a series of questions like which challenges they are believe so these questions are supposed to to help the person realize the lapses in their and in their beliefs in their faith in order to come to their own realizations independently so independently means you are not playing a role yours is just to question some motives and objectives they have in the dean you understand so that you 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 put your point across so, but don't be quick in telling them they are wrong or right because this is what the sectarians are good at doing they are easily telling you you are wrong or you are this you are that they like to judge people you know out of ignorance because most of them are not learned by the way you see so by this uh before i start but i was with life in a shaitan regime i seek refuge with allah against the accursed devil Hazi sabili adu ila Allah ala basiratin ana wa manit tabani wa suba ana Allahi wa ma ana min al mushrikin. Ya you al lazina amanu takulla wa kunu ma as sadikin. O you who believe the way of God and be with those who are honest, that is those who are truthful. So always you have to look for those who are honest and truthful, who are able to tell you the truth instead of manipulating your conscience and telling you lies and whatever have you. Uh, so like I said earlier, today we are here to see the misconceptions being put in front of us based on the concept the Sunnis and the Hadith use. Uh, I, chose the, I chose specifically the misconceptions of the Sunnis because they are in the majority of the so-called man-made Islam, which is different from the Quranic Islam. The man-made Islam, they are presented out, out there. They are in the majority. And then when I say the Hadith use, because even if you have a Shia, uh, you know, a, a Shia person, he believes in Hadith. If you have somebody from the Tijani, Tijani sector, he believes in Hadith. If you have somebody from Ahmadiyya and so forth and so on, they all believe in the Hadith. So I categorize them as Hadith use. 
So I decided to elevate the Sunnis in a different position before mentioning Hadith use. Uh, number one criteria is the Sunnis are the ones boosting of Hadith. And you hear them calling those who put their faith in the Quran alone as a source of guidance, you hear them calling them Hadith rejectors. Now, out of their foolishness, they, they forgot that even their own scholars reject certain hadiths. <laughs> their own scholars reject hadiths that doesn't suit them. So if your scholar themselves rejects your own hadith, do you call your scholar and hadith rejecter? The answer is no. Because in the categorizations of the hadith books you have, you have some you have mentioned as da'if. Da'if means weak which means it cannot, it, can, it cannot be used as a test of the time. And then you have hadith which you'll call Hassan, which is categorized by your own scholars who tell you that this is good, but not in the highest grade. Then you have your own scholars who categorize hadith and term it as Sahih, which means authentic. So if they have to now certify a hadith for you to follow, it means, it means, you are not following the prophet actually the way you claim you're following the prophet because it, according to you if the prophet makes a statement somebody else have to assess his statement and weigh it before passing on judgment for you the layman to actually follow the Hajj command there's a problem with that because if you claim in your own doctrine that the prophet is the one giving you legislation then how come after the legislation of the prophet, somebody else has to legislate the sayings of your prophet before you follow? So, you know, that's another fallacy they commit in their understanding, full of contradictions as uh, they present to us. Now, one of the reasons is, I'm going to present to you one of the ways the, the mushriks, or uh, the Sunnis, I would say, or the Hadithians, they like to present their arguments. And most of the time, when I face them, I tell them your argument is childish, it's naive, it's stupid. You understand? Because what you have to understand is the Quran sent down as a guidance for mankind. Whatever you don't find in the space of the Quran has nothing to do with God. Whatever you invent for yourself, that's up to you. You understand? So if I go on the day of judgment, there are certain stupid questions you, the Sunnis and the Hadiths, you keep asking people like us who uphold the Quran as a source of guidance. You keep up asking us questions as to, OK, how did the Quran get to you? How was the Quran preserved? Do you think I'll go and stand in front of God and he's asking me, hey, Baba Shrai, I am God. So I'm asking you, how was my Quran preserved before you got it? Hello, it's just like asking somebody who receive a parcel from FedEx or DHL or UPS. You are asking the recipient, how did the package get to you? Hello, what do you mean by that rubbish? What do I need that for? Do you get the point? What do I need that for? So are you saying if I don't know how it got to me, that makes the package invalid? You see how stupid they sound sometimes. Because it tells you how they can nullify their faith within the blink of an eye without actually realizing what they are doing. Because to me, logically, I call them the enemies of the prophet. Simple. You understand? Because if any, any person in his right senses will not uphold garbage had he's telling him the prophet who is prominent in have marrying a six years old girl after Quran condemning such a habit of marrying, uh, you know, infants or girls are the under the age of puberty because you cannot consider six years old to be at the age of puberty it's not even up to the puberty age and more or less to even say nine years it doesn't make sense you understand uh so many a times you see them trying to question the motives around by questioning you and saying okay if you say you believe in the quran alone you are going to follow how do you pray that is the dumbest question ever somebody can ask you because if you take the whole, the entirety of the Quran, you will never see a question, the, the prophet or the messenger in the Quran being questioned about Salat. Nowhere in the Quran will you see the believers, the disbelievers, the hypocrites, whoever it is, asking the prophet or God saying, yes, alone ke anis Salat. When they ask you about the Salat, say no, you won't find that. Salat didn't start with Prophet Muhammad. You'll be a fool to think the Salat started with Prophet Muhammad. Simple. 
Because Ibrahim alayhi salam established the Salat. Quran chapter 14 verse 40. He told God. He says, Rabbi ja'alni mukima salatu wa mizuriyati rabbana wa taqabbal dua. He said, God, make me an establisher of the Salat and of my descendants. So my Lord answer my invocation. So when he started establishing the Salat, he passed it on to his descendants and it got to us. So if Abraham is the leader for mankind, Quran chapter 2, verse 124, he has been made as the leader for mankind, the Imam for mankind. So the point is, uh, Uh, Ishmael, Ishmael, Ishmael Kojo says you are making a point, but your language is too harsh. Uh, he says, please use kind words to address your points. Thank you. Uh, well, it depends how you categorize my word as harsh, uh, because using words such as stupid, foolish, you know, ignorant, and so on, they are not. I don't. I don't see it as harsh, in any sense, because if somebody acts stupid, you should call. You should term it as stupid, and it's somebody asks smart you should tell it term it as smart so i don't see the harshness there maybe you see it as such but we have difference of, on of opinion on that and again uh you see we have a notion of understanding whereby when 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 you're using rationale to actually tell somebody the mistakes they do what they forget to realize is they think you are being offensive. And that is why the truth hurts. Quran chapter 43, verse 78, God says, We have brought you the truth, but most of you hate the truth. Now, the reason why people will hate the truth, because the truth is, is, is strict, is straightforward, is harsh. That's how the truth feels like. So the moment you start seeing somebody trying to t tell you you are harsh, He's not actually using rationale to look at the message you are speaking, but he's using his emotions to now deal with you instead of dealing with the message being addressed at. You understand? Uh -huh. Hey, Salam, uh, Zamani, but you. Now, so what? What are, the point I'm, I'm building up is you encounter people in the modern day we live in who, who will try to act superior to you trying to say, who are you to question our scholars? Number one, the prophet didn't assign the so-called scholars you have today as our scholars. He didn't assign Imam Maliki, Hanbali, Shafi, Hanafi as, as our scholars. We don't know them. Actually, I call them imposters because none of the sectarians can actually prove to me these people have been assigned by any authority coming from God. You understand? So when it comes to Islam, these are imposters. I don't know them. And God never made mention of them. Neither did he say we should rely on them. And if somebody will keep telling you, hey, we need to rely on the uh, previous predecessors, the scholars. No, 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 no. no. The, the religion is not for the scholars. It's for God. Right? So if any shallow-minded person will tell you that, oh, if you reject the Hadith, it means you are rejecting the Quran. Why? Because the same people who preserve the Quran are the same people who preserve the Hadith. That's a lie. No scholar can prove that. Huh? If you tell me the same people who preserve the Hadith are the same people who preserve the Quran, then you are the biggest hypocrite ever. What makes you a, a hypocrite? Now, you are an, a, a hypocrite because Prophet Muhammad, salam, right? The preservation of the Quran wasn't the duty of the people or believers. Nowhere in the Quran did God say we are going to assign people to be the preservers of the quran so in the first place you are nuts when you say people are preserving the quran right god never claimed that people will be the one to preserve the quran right so as for the even the remembrance of the quran itself the zikra of the quran itself chapter 15 verse 9 right God and his uh, angels are the ones to preserve the remembrance, the azikra of the Quran. It is not the duty of people to preserve the Quran. Right? Surah al waqiyah God termed the, the, the Quran, uh, he termed the Quran 
as kitabim maknun. He says, innahu la Quran al karim fi kitabim maknun. And this protected Quran, this uh, uh, something that God has protected, this Quran in the book was not assigned to a person to protect it. So if God, in his infinite wisdom, can actually preserve you, the human being, and protect you, the human being, from being for, for being alive for so many years on earth, is it a book he cannot protect or preserve that you, the human being, has to do this for him? So he become a helpless God. So you now have to decide how the book has to reach people, right? Then somebody will ask you, okay, now you have the Quran. Where did you get it from? That's a stupid question again. We are there. God has sent a guidance to mankind. Remember, Quran chapter 92, verse 12. God says the guidance upon us is the guidance. Inna alayna al huda. The guidance is upon God. It's not upon you. So as for the way God will guide people, you'll be stupid enough to be asking people, how did the Quran get to you? That's the dumbest question ever. Remember, if somebody is sending a mail to you, he must have known your address, how to reach you. So that is how the Quran will get to you because God sent the Quran as a guidance for mankind. Now, so let's move on. Now, some, some of the mainstream uh, sectarians, the Sunnis or the, the other sectarians will now ask you that uh, if you don't believe in Hadith books or the Sunnah, what they call sunnah because i challenge them always to prove to us where it says sunnah to nabi the sunnah of the prophet it doesn't exist in the quran uh the prophet doesn't have his own doings anything he does in the religion is based on the quran you find it there even the hypocrite themselves they said holoko quran they said the character of the prophet himself was the quran entirety so whatever they did, the prophet did was based on the quran the prophet did not do anything outside the quran right so as a prophet and as a messenger he testified it himself quran chapter 46 verse 9 that he only follows what has been inspired to him he doesn't follow any other source you understand so if god says if he says there has been certainly a good pattern in the messenger of god for you if you take the quran you see whatever the messenger of god has been commanded you see his footsteps that is what you have to follow so these people will now tell ask you, the one who follow the Quran alone for guidance. They will just open like chapter 2, verse 1, Alif, Lam, Im. Then they will ask you, how did you know how to recite it in that order? How to say Alif, Lam, Im. According to them, it is the narrations. The narrations or the Sunnah will teach you how to, to recite that. That is the dumbest, dumbest questioning and excuse ever. <laughs> You understand what what has the recitation what what impact does the recitation have on the meaning of what the words are what what impact i give an example for instance the word milo right m i l o milo if for people who drink this uh, kind of uh, you know drink milo like hot drink i have somebody or i know people who also call the same word milo they say my low because sometimes in english when the second letter is i after a particular word it can be sound it can make sound as i instead of e right so we have people just like if you spell the word mine m-i-n-e is mine you don't say mine you understand uh-huh then this milo whilst people say milo which is correct as well they both intend the same thing right so pronunciation of the word has no impact to the meaning since the meaning remains the same so with the quranic recitations so far you find a lot of scholars recite the quran in different fashions then they will lie to you and say oh the prophet recited it in this before in that in this version in that version that's a lie there is only one recitation of the quran which is based in quran chapter 2 verse 121 there is one recitation of the that is it through recitation you recite it as you see it so now when you take chapter 2 verse 1 alif lamim written there 
the sectarian will now question you and say, how did you know how to recite it without relying on external sources? First of all, Arabic is a language which is being written down, right? And Quran came in in a clear Arabic language and is being recited and read throughout time. Quran chapter 35, verse 32. God says, Thumma awrathna al-kitab astafayna min ibadina. God says he will cause the servants whom he has chosen to inherit the book. So the inheritance of the Quran, the Al-Kitab, is done by the servants of God, whom we will also encounter and see, as I'm doing lectures today. I'm using the Quran to do lectures. People are witnessing what I'm saying and because I have knowledge of the book. You understand? So servants of God will impact other servants of God. Do you pass in the knowledge? Uh, salam for everyone joining now. Uh -huh. So... If you tell me I need to rely on external source like Hadith or Sunnah to now understand the Quran, you are not okay. Do you get the point? Because throughout the Quran, there is nothing termed as Sunnah and Nabi. It doesn't exist. Whatever the Prophet is doing, God says in Quran chapter 33, verse 38, Ma kana ala nabi uh, min harajin fi ma farad Allahu lahu. Then God says, Sunnat Allahi. You understand? So whatever God has ordained for the prophet, we see it in the Quran. If God ordained for him to do something, we see it in the Quran. If God forbid him from doing something, we see it in the Quran. Whatever God has ordained for the prophet, we see it. And that is the, called the Sunnat Allah. It is no more the Sunnat and Nabi. For you to go and say he married a six years old girl, so that is a Sunnah. You are a fool to think like that. One line. Somebody will say, oh, he's calling people fools. Prophet Musa, alayhi salam, Quran chapter 7, verse 155 to 156. He called some of his people foolish people because they acted foolish. It's simple as it is. It's not an insult. You did a foolish act, you should be called foolish person. You do get the, po the, po the point. Uh -huh. So it is not as if... I'm just coming to sit here, put the mic on me, and then insult people. No. <laughs> Bitter truth is better than sugar-coated lies. I will not come and brush off the, the, the screen and then let you feel like I, I'm, I'm, I'm romancing your ego. I'll tell you straight to your face. Yes. Aha. Uh -huh. So the other day I went to a, a, a platform called Clubhouse, and then somebody was asking me that, uh, okay, Brother Shrive, if if... The, the Alif Lami is written in the Quran. How would you recite it? And I said, Alif Lami. He says, how did, I, how did you know that's how to recite it? You see the dumbest question. So imagine me going in front of God on the day of judgment. Then he's going to ask me, Shaib the life. When I gave the Quran, the first letter of chapter two, the first letters, how did you recite it? Oh God, I didn't recite it well. Then God will say, okay, Abba Shaib, you are going to hell. <laughs> Just because of that. How dumb can people be? Quran chapter 2 verse 44. Are you exhorting the people to righteousness while forgetting yourself when you read the book? You recite the book. You have the book. You recite it. Yours is just to implement and practice the book. Quran chapter 6 verse 155. Huh? It's a blessed book. Huh? Uh, if I remember the verse clearly, let me open the verse. Quran chapter 6, verse 155. Apart from that, there is also chapter 38, verse 29, where he says, Kitab an ayatihi wal ulil albab. It's a blessed book, which we have revealed so that they may contemplate its verses. So the Quran wants us to contemplate the verses. It's not about your wish, wish, wishful or uh, uh, your personal desires whereby you think just because somebody doesn't believe in the doc indoctrination you have been made, that makes the person a, a disbeliever. You understand? Uh -huh. So this is the common sense most of the mainstream Muslims lack. And I won't say mo mainstream Muslims, I would say mainstream mushriks because they are visibly doing shirk. Uh, Quran chapter 6 Verse 155, it clearly says, 
And this is a blessed book which we have revealed. So follow it and become pious so that you may attain mercy. So in order to attain mercy from the book, you need to follow the book. You follow the book, then you have the mercy because the book is a blessed book on its own. It is not for recitation to get a blessing. Right? So even if I don't know how to recite the book perfectly, mine is just to follow the book. It's not about how to recite the book. <laughs> You'll be the dumbest person on earth to actually think just because somebody doesn't recite the book as you recite it, so that means he cannot follow the book. And remember, the Quran was sent as a guidance for mankind. It's not the guidance for only, only the people of Muhammad. Neither does it say only the Arabs. Neither is it a guidance only for the children of Israel. Do you see? Uh -huh. But however, what people refuse to understand is, you know, always Sunnis are, are prideful. They, they are boastful and prideful because of their scholars and whatever they have. So they think just because their scholars write down instructions for them to follow or give them interpretations from their own personal desires that make them the excellent perpetrators of the deen, which is wrong. Most Sunnis th actually think Prophet Muhammad is the one who propagated Islam, which is another wrong concept. Islam didn't start with Prophet Muhammad. Neither did the Salat start with Prophet Muhammad. It was Ibrahim alayhi salam who started establishing the Salat, as said in Quran chapter 14, verse 40, where he told God, Rabbi ja'alni mukima salati wa mizuriyati rabbana wa taqabbal du'ai. So when he started establishing the Salat, that is why God asked us to follow the millat Ibrahim hanifa. Wa ma kena min al-mushirkin. So Prophet Muhammad himself, Quran chapter 6, verse 161, he says, Kul inna ni hadani rabbi ila sirat al-mustakim. So he says, my Lord has guided me to a straight path. That is the creed of Abraham. You understand? So he was guided to the footsteps of Abraham. And we can find it in the Quran. Now you hear some ignorant sectarians telling you because God says, And they refuse to understand that we find everything about the Rasul in the Quran. Yes, anything you need about the Rasul is in the Quran. Everything about Muhammad's personal life, we don't care. For instance, how Prophet Muhammad eats food is none of our business. Because of the way you eat food, God will not put you to hell and say, because you use your right hand, why didn't you use the fork? Why didn't you use three fingers? Why didn't you use spoon? It's none of God's business. We don't care. The way he slept with his wives, we don't care. Out of their ignorance, they'll tell you sleeping with your wife, you have to do it as Prophet Muhammad did. As if you're watching a pornography, excuse me to say. I don't understand this. You call this sunnah? <laughs> so how did the prophet Muhammad father and mother slept with each other before giving birth to him? Does that make him Arham? Because they didn't follow any sunnah. You understand? So some of them will now tell you, oh, uh, you know, uh, God sent the prophet uh, so they will tell you the hikmah here, our scholars said it means sunnah. <laughs> Out of coverage area. I thought you the Sunni says the prophet has explained everything for you. You Sunnis claim he's the best mufassir of the Quran. So if that is the case, where did the prophet explain hikmah to become sunnah for you? We are yet to see any proof. You don't have it. Where Prophet Muhammad said hikmah means sunnah. They don't have it. All they have is Ibn Kathir says, our scholars says, our ulama says, Ibn, uh, uh, Imam Maliki says, that's all. You understand? So what I'm exhorting the people to understand, learn how to separate the real Islam from the mushrik's Islam. The mushrik's Islam is what we call the Sunni Islam. The mushrik's Islam is what we call Shia Islam. The Mushrik's Islam is what we call Tijaniya Islam. The real Islam that God has given can be found in the book of God, which is the guidance for mankind. The other day, I, I was having a conversation with another brother, which made, he made me laugh a lot. 
He says the guidance, the Quran is not the only guidance God has given us, right? It's not, he says the Quran is not the guidance. So I wanted to educate him on this fallacy. I even educated him on the platform, but I know he's following his whims and desires. Now, let me help the audience just in case you encounter such people around you to know the fallacies they commit in their arguments, right? Uh -huh. It's a straw man argument. Now, when you take Quran chapter 2, verse 159, that is Surah to Baqarah, you go to Quran chapter 2, verse 159. God says, Inna yakutumuna ma anzalna min al wal huda. Then he says, Min baadi ma bayyannahu linnas fil kitab. So God says, indeed, those who conceal what we have revealed or sent down of the evidences, that's the proofs, the proofs, but you're not. Then he says, walhuda, that is, and the guidance. God has revealed, right? He revealed it of the proofs and the guidance. Then God says, mimbaadi ma bayyannahu. So for every intellectual Arabian or person who knows Arabic, listen to me. God says, al -huda. The, the Huda is a marifa. It's a definite article. In English, we say the specificity of a reference. So the guidance, God has revealed, and the guidance. Then he says, after that which we have made it clear in the book, min ba'di ma bayyannahu, bayyannahu, An ignorant sectarian is now telling me, no, the Quran is not the guidance. And God says he has made the guidance clear fil kitab, in the book. So clearly the verse is telling you the curse of God is upon them. They are concealing the guidance of God. The guidance is in the Quran. That's why God says, Sharu Ramadan Lazi Unzila feel Quran hudan linas. And this ignorant mushrik is saying the Quran is not their guidance. Okay, let me educate him again. Quran chapter 43. When you start reading from verse 1 to verse 3, to verse 4, or maybe I can say to verse 3. Let's see, is the Quran the Al-Kitab? Is it the Quran or not? Or the Quran, is it the Al-Kitab or not? Because if I come to you and I see you reading a book and I say, give me the book and you say, which book? I have to be specific. So I will say the Quran. You understand? The Quran is written in a book. Chapter 56, verse, 76, uh, verse 77 to 78 says, Innahu la Quran al karim Then it says, Fi kitab maknun. The Quran is the reading but it's written on the sheets of paper, which makes it a book. So it becomes the book. So I'm going to break it down. Quran chapter 43, verse 1 to verse 4. Listen what God says. He says, ha -mi. Now, on top of the ha -mi, you see a madda sign when you have the Quran with you. When we say madda, something you prolong. You pronounce it with prolonging sound. So ha -mi means you pronounce the pronunciation. You prolong it. It doesn't matter whether you say, hmm, that's up to you. So far as the letters doesn't change, it's still there. So now, then he says, yeah, uh, yeah, I see you, Abraham Moshe. Yes, thank you for coming. He says, wal kitab in mubin, by the clear book. Now, if this is being told, you are reading that from the Quran, right? The book you are reading is called the Quran. So now you are reading from the Quran, and he says, by the clear book. Then it went ahead to tell you, Inna ja'alnahu Qur'anan Arabiyan la'allakum ta'kilun. Indeed, we have made it. This ja'alnahu, there's a masculine pronoun at the end of ja'alnahu. This masculine pronoun denotes what was mentioned prior to that. So the, what was mentioned was the al-kitab, kitab mubin. Because the book you are reading, you are reading the Qur'an from the book. So the book, if you want to give it a name, it becomes the Quran. So God now says, Inna ja -nahu, this thing you are reading as a clear book, we have made it an Arabic reading, an Arabic Quran. Perhaps you will what? 
reason unless if you don't have reasoning then you claim that the book is not the quran then obviously you are the dumbest person on earth the book you are reading is the quran so when i took you to quran chapter 2 verse 159 god says indeed those who conceal what we have sent down or revealed of the proofs that is the evidences and the guidance god has already revealed the guidance it's in the quran it's in the book so automatically the book is the guidance god has brought to you you hear the mushriks telling you no 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 the guidance is not only the quran the guidance is prophet muhammad himself <laughs> <laughs> let me help such people again quran chapter 42 verse 52 let's go and see does it say prophet muhammad is the guidance or does it say he can guide also there's a difference there's a difference between saying something is the guide and saying something can guide remember before i take you to quran chapter 42 verse 52 it is not only prophet muhammad who can guide you before i go to chapter 42 verse 52 it is not only prophet muhammad who can guide you unless if you take those words out of context but to say our guidance is based on prophet muhammad will be a contradiction it will be a fallacy because quran chapter 2 verse 272 says Laysa yadi man yasha. their guidance is not upon you but guide god guides whomever he wills so in, in originally the guidance of mankind is not based on muhammad so you'll be a fool to say the guidance we have to follow in islam is based on muhammad you are the dumbest fool ever you understand now i'm taking you to quran chapter 42 verse 52 before i take you to quran chapter 42 verse 52 if you go to quran chapter 7 verse 181 Let's go and see, can other people guide you with the permission of God by following the truth? Yes, they can. So then I will take you to 4252, then you understand. So in Quran chapter 7, verse 181, God says, and among those we created is a group of people, a nation, Ummatun, guiding to the truth and by it, not by them, by it, which is a singular pronoun by it they do justice so among those god has created he didn't say one person it's not muhammad who will guide you no muhammad was also able to guide his people because god has guided him so he was sent to the Ummiyuna, and he guided them with the help of god so now this modern day and age we don't need any garbage book any garbage sunnah any garbage hadith to come and say is going to guide us because muhammad in the first place our guidance is not based on, based on him you'll be a fool to say our guidance is based on prophet muhammad as i quoted quran chapter 2 verse 272 pay attention so now i shown you the evidence of quran chapter 7 verse 181 and among those we created is a nation guiding to the truth and by it they do justice so what god wants you to do is to do justice by the guidance he has given you he doesn't want you to be unjust. So now Quran chapter 42 verse 52, listing clearly why in that verse God says Muhammad will guide people to the straight path. But remember, it doesn't mean he has his own form of guidance as the mushriks claim the hadith books and the sunnah will guide you. So pay attention carefully because the devious sectarians you see are smart in what they do. And that is why a criminal is twice smarter than you can be, because that is what he has to be smarter than you in order to, to, to rob you, to defraud you, to trick you. And that is why fraudsters are very, very smart. You understand? And so is a liar. A liar is very, very smart because he knows how to trick you in order to lie to you. When you go to Quran chapter 42, verse 52, God says, ruhan min amrina ma kunta. God says, and thus have we inspired a spirit of our command to you, Muhammad. You did not know what the book was or what was the book or the faith. So Muhammad in his past life was ignorant. He doesn't know what the book was 
Al-Kitab, he did not know what uh, the faith, Iman, Islam was. What, what are the mushriks telling you? That Muhammad was giving guidance even at a childhood, when he was a, a baby, when he was a child. The angel came from heaven and in hoping he had his heart, he put the silver tree of wisdom or golden tree of what kind of jumble coquanas story is this? You are, you are mingling the guidance of God with the jumbles of books your scholars have written down. It's just like comparing Nokia 3310. Not, Nokia 3310 is even better. It's just like comparing the ancient mobile phones. I would say the mobile phone which first came out in the 1990s with the antenna, you have to pull the antenna, the big ones, you open and hold. In Ghana, we say, that big one, you open like this and pull the antenna, you are comparing that with the smartphone of today. Are you, are you nuts? <laughs> are you dumb? <laughs> so if your scholar existed 30 years ago, are you going to compare your scholar's knowledge to me, Shwaib Abdullah, in the modern day using a smartphone? Are you okay? Somebody sitting in the desert has written some books for you and you think that scholar is more wiser than me of today. As would allow anyone to kill. So he says, you did not know what was the book or the faith, but we have made it a light. Remember, if you are in the darkness, you need a torchlight to find a way. Right? So according to the Quran, chapter 14, 14 verse 1, God sent the book in order to bring people out of the darknesses into the light. So if you're having a torchlight and you're looking for the way, the torchlight is to aid you to see the way. So God says, he says, you did not know what the book was, nor the faith, you, Muhammad, but we have made it. What is that? The book. We have made it a light by which we guide, not you, Muhammad, guide, by which we guide whomever we will among our servants. By which we guide whomever we will among our servants. So God can guide whomever he wills. So after he has guided Muhammad, now listen what God is telling Muhammad. Then he says, And indeed, you shall guide to a straight path. Because he has now been guided by the book. So by the same book, he can now guide somebody to a straight path. And what is the straight path? It doesn't mean sunnah. You are a fool to think the straight path is the sunnah. You are a fool to think the straight path is the hadith the scholars has given, have given you. The straight path is the Quran. Quran chapter 6 verse 153. You find the straight path in the book, in the book he has given you. So why go to a garbage uh, uh, book? Another scholar has given you to claim that is your guidance, unless you are a mushrik. Simple. So coming back to the title, I chose the title, The Misconceptions of the Sunnis and the Hadith Yuns. When I say Hadith Yuns, they are the people who are proud to follow the garbage books after the Quran. And they claim, hey, the prophet marries his years old, old girl. We are proud of it. You are nuts. You don't know. You are nuts to be proud of that garbage books your scholars have written for you. And you claim that is Islam? Is that the Islam given to you in the book of God? The answer is no. Now, you hear this mainstream Muslim saying that even though we don't find the, the, the raka'at in the Quran, the five salat we have been given, I put a challenge out there. Let them come and prove to me the five salat they've been doing every day, five day, five times in a day. Come and prove to me in the Quran where it says the five salat with their names. You come and show me salat al uh, asr. Come and show me salat al uh, zuhur. Come and show me salat al maghrib. And come and show me the salat al jum'ah you are doing all. And I promise you, I'll pay you 1,000 euro if you can prove to me live on a live dialogue. Don't stand somewhere and say your gibberish because you are alone. I'm here calling your scholars out. You are running like zebras running from the lion. <laughs> so Quran chapter 6 verse 116. Quran chapter 6 verse 116. He says, You do look at answer lie. He says, if you obey most of those on earth, they will mislead you from the way of God. And why will they do that? 
because they are only what assuming they only follow assumptions and they are only guessing so now who are the majority on earth today majority is you claim christians are the majority or you claim the sunnis the shias are the majority that's who are the ones boasting around us you have christians boasting and you have the mainstream muslims who are the mushriks not muslims who are the mushriks sunni and shia boasting if you obey most of those these groups you'll be misled you'll be misled from the way of god now when we say the way of god it is the way you build a union it's a goal having an objective between you and your maker right you can never be a good believer if you only believe without doing good deeds or righteous acts the righteous acts defines your belief even in the bible james uh, james chapter 2 verse 20 or chapter 2 verse 26 if you have faith and you don't put in the work your faith is baller is garbage so don't waste your time and claim you have faith quran chapter 2 verse 8 he says among the people are those who say we believe in god in the last day but they are not believers that is what god says so you claiming to be a believer does cannot even move a fly when you are a believer it is a faith between you and your maker you understand god will never send you to go and kill somebody unjustly god will not tell you just because somebody was once a muslim and then he decided not to become a muslim today that means you have to go and kill him it doesn't exist you see now what people refuse to understand is the mainstream branded type of islam present now the, the problem with people is you know the the mainstream uh, sectarians they are very arrogant and prideful and the moment you say you reject the garbage books their scholars are upholding there is this animosity they throw at you whilst forgetting that their own scholars also reject some hadith look the hadith that the sunnis are upholding shias reject them the hadith that the sheets are upholding the sunnis reject them then we have this small group in between based in africa tijaniya they also have selective hadiths they take from both sides you understand now this hypocritical conduct they have is what baffles me they all claim claim to believe in the quran but yet they don't uphold the quran as the source of guidance whatever they are doing is different from what the quran says you understand uh-huh yes yes javier de la cruz the reason why the sectarians are claiming that they pray five times a day and they have the rakat, the karakaat they are doing, which is the, the, the postures they are using, the prostration, the bowing, which they have been instructed by the hadith books. You don't find such postures in the Quran telling you get up four times, do this, do this, go down five, five times, three times. No, it's like a formation of football, like four, three, three, four, two, four. It's like now, what the sectarians do is they have this hadith book. I quote this hadith. The narration is found in Sahih al Bukhari 350. Book reference, book number eight, hadith number two. The hadith is telling us that Nana Aisha, who was six years or nine years, this little girl, they claimed the Prophet married, which is a lie. The Quran doesn't condone such rubbish. Vora Vora, I have to use this Nima Nima tactics for the kids small so that they can uh, give me some peace. <laughs> so I will not mafia them, don't worry. They, they are my treasures. Uh -huh. So Nanaisha narrated. The, according to the Mushriks, they claim Nanaisha is the mother of believers. How can a young girl, how can a small lady be the mother of believers? Uh -huh. Is she in the Quran? The answer is no. Did God mention this small girl in the Quran? The answer is no. You'll be a fool to think this person actually exists in Islam. The mother of believers, she said, God enjoined the salat. When he enjoined it, it was two rakats. Now, Nanaisha narrated that God enjoined the salat, and when he enjoyed the salat, it was two rakats. Only. Only two rakats. 
So that means when God ordained the five salats, they claimed the prophet went to the skies to go and bring. It was only two two rakats, two two rakats. Remember, according to the garbage hadith, it says when the prophet went, God told him, my words do not change. So now, if the words of God do not change according to the hadith, the way they claim, he went to collect five. Remember, before it became five, it started from 50 prayers. So the 50 became five. So later on, when it became five, he now brought it according to Danaisha in this hadith. He says the raka'at is two, two raka'ats. When I say raka'at, the postures you see the mainstream mushriks doing when they are praying, they go up, they count, they have kabali the body. If you forget, you have to go kabali, you have to go ba'adi. Uh -huh. That one, it was two, two raka'at. These two, two raka'at, according to Danaisha, both went in residence on, on a journey. So even if you are going on a journey, it was two. Even if you are at home, it was two. Then the prayers, the salat offered on journey remained the same. It remained two. But the raka'at of the prayers for non-travelers were increased. Were increased by who? Hello? Who increased it? By who? So God, after giving you the five prayers with the two, two raka'at, he now decided, hey, you guys, you know what? The two, two raka'at is easy. So increase it. The Fajr will remain two. The Asr and the Zuhur make it four, four. The Maghrib make it three. Uh, the Isha make it four. Because I think you guys are lazy. So I have to increase it a bit so that you can be active. Is that what you are telling us? The Nana Aisha in this Hadith is saying the Raka'at was the only two, two, but it was increased. Increased by who? No problem. We are questioning you. Try to find the time to answer these questions. Now, <laughs> the dumbest questions again they will keep asking you is why do you reject the sunnah of the prophet number one Ahi, the prophet doesn't have a sunnah prove to us from the quran where he says sunnah and nabi it doesn't exist so how can you foolishly tell me i'm rejecting something which doesn't exist out of your hypocrisy you are saying the first source of islam is the quran the second source is the sunnah according to their foolishness if the second source is the sunnah the first source must mention the second source now does the first source mention the sunnah of the prophet the answer is no so how can you foolishly claim i'm rejecting the sunnah of the prophet when it doesn't exist in the first place we claim you are following other books aside the quran you claim sunnah or hadith is not a book but you foolishly have to go and find references in other books in order to make your point. Is that not a book? The other day I was asking this ignorant scholar from, uh, it's not even a scholar, the guy from South Africa, uh, Fahim. I'm asking him to give us a proof where God gave them the authority to follow the Hadith books. He is now telling me that Hadith is not a book. They are following books. And it could be even millions of books. You see how proud the mushrik is. <laughs> Guys, all I'm doing is to exhort the people to get up, open your conscience and study. That's all. Quran chapter 18, verse 29. al haqqu kul al haqqu min rabbikum fa man sha'a fal yumin wa man sha'a fal yakfru faith is a choice you can decide to believe or disbelieve don't let anybody force you and 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 and, and, and like struggle with you and say hey you have to believe me by force no <laughs> faith is a choice you either believe or disbelieve but that shouldn't stop you from using your rationale your intelligence your iq to question things around you ladies and gentlemen now I'll top up with this before I give chance. Now, for anybody who is telling you, go and study Hadith books. Don't waste your time. They are full of garbages. I'm telling you for a fact. You will never find any sensible thing in the Hadith books, more than the Quran. Wallahi. Quran chapter 17 verse 9 says, Inna Quran Indeed, this Quran guides that which is more appropriate. This is what Quran God says in the Quran. So if the Quran guides to that which is more appropriate, why waste my time to follow the garbages the scholars are writing down again? If anybody tells you 
Go and study other books from the ulama or whatever, whatever garbage ulama they are telling you. Simply quote Quran chapter 68, verse 36 to 38. God is asking a question. Malakum kaifa takumum. Amlakum kitabun fihi tadurusun. Inna lakum fihi lama tahayarun. He is asking you a question. How do you judge? Do you have a book wherein you study? Apart from the Quran that he has given. Do you have a book wherein you study? In that book, do you find whatever you choose or prefer? Do you find whatever you prefer? Is this the garbage hadith books giving you whatever you prefer in Islam? Or you want to keep being mushriks in the Sunni Islam, Shia Islam, Tijaniya Islam, Ahmadiyya Islam? Is that what you want? You understand? Is that what you want? To be following these garbage books the scholars give you? So now God is asking you a simple question. If you go to Quran chapter 34, verse 44, let me give you this verse. Quran chapter 34, verse 44. And I want to pr prove to you something here, that the Arabs, the Arabs, these mushriks are proud of the Arabs saying that the Arabs has given them books. These Arabs, let's see, have, has God ever given them any book aside the Quran to study? The answer is no. God never gave Arabs any other book to study concerning Islam. He never ever gave them any book apart from the Quran to study. You will be a fool if you think there is any other book after the Quran which serves as a guidance in Islam. Quran chapter 34 verse 44. Wa ma arsalna ilayhim kablaka min nazir god says and we did not give them if you want to understand he's talking to the arabs start from the context of the verses above quran chapter 34 verse 44 you do you see he says and we did not give them any books which they could study who are they the arabs he's not talking about the children of israel he's not talking about the people in the past He's talking about the arabs God did not give them books, any book which they could study. When we say kutubin, is the plural form of kitab. Any writings, as a matter of fact, any writings in history, God never gave the Arabs any other books. You will be a fool to think the garbage books the scholars have given you are the books of God or the books of Islam. Wallahi lazim. God says he never gave them any books which they could study. Nor did we send any warner to them before you, Muhammad. Which is still talking about the Arabs. So now after the Quran, is there any other book after the Quran for the Arabs? The answer is no. So where did they get the jumbos of loads of books they have after the Quran? The only book given to Muhammad was the Quran. Your Hadith books claim the Prophet follow only the Quran. So if that is the case, and God says I should follow the footsteps of the messenger, why would I do something different the prophet or the messenger never did? If I ask you a simple question, did he follow Sahih Bukhari? You said no. Did he follow Sahih Muslim? You said no. Did he meet them? You said no. Did he give them authority to write such books? You said no. Who authorized them as Sahih Hadith? You said your scholars. Are you a fool? Are your scholars smarter than the prophet? And then you are boastfully telling us that if we reject the Sunnah, we are not Muslims. Are you a fool? How can I reject something which doesn't exist? If he exists, open the Quran and show us. Then they will say, Wa ma atakum rasul He gave you the Sunnah. Are you a fool? Wa ma atakum rasul the Rasul gave me the Sunnah. Then open the Quran and show me where he says he gave you Sunnah to follow. Ladies and gentlemen, to bring the topic to an end, don't be part of the group who will come on the day of judgment. Quran chapter 33, verse 67. They will come and tell God by lamenting. They will tell God, indeed, we obeyed our leaders and our masters, but they misled us from the way. Because you are only obeying the, uh, Ibn Kathir, 
Ibn Taymiyyah, Ibn Abbas. Who are these people? Who are they? Are they the messenger? Are they the messengers? Are they, has God assigned them as a messenger? Is any of them the prophets? The Maliki, Shafi, Hanbali, Hanafi, are they the prophets? Are they the messengers? The Hadith books you are following from your scholars, are they the messengers God assigned? If the answer is no, why waste my time? You see, our, our ulama has decided by consensus that if anybody rejects the sunnah, he is a mushri, uh, he's a, he's a kafir. Oh my God, I should even be enjoying my popcorn and watching Netflix. If your scholars think I'm a mushri or kafir, <laughs> because at the end of the day, they will also be judged by the same God. So if God didn't say that rubbish, why will I waste my time adhering to your garbage books? <laughs> no wonder your scholars will keep running away. <laughs> now, like I said, <clears throat> if you go to Quran chapter 43, verse 43 to verse 44, this is where I'll end uh, this part. Let me check my time. Yeah, then I can give the chance for callers to call in. Chapter 43, verse 43 to verse 44. Now, see what will happen on the day of judgment and see what God is telling the, the messenger, the prophet. That is in Quran chapter. Nadira kuna kuo. Kuna kuo. Kuo angani balsuna. Now, <clears throat> when we go to Quran chapter 43, verse 43 to verse 44, then God says, Fastamsik billazi uhiya ilayka innaka ala siratin mustaqim. Verse 44, wa innahu la zikrun laka wa likawmika, uh, wa likawmika, wa sawfatus alun. So adhere to what has been inspired to you, Muhammad, indeed you are upon a straight path. Because he has been given the straight path, which is the Quran, right? Then God says, indeed, it is a remembrance for you and for your people. So the Quran is to serve as a remembrance for you and your people. And you will be questioned. Now, when God is going to question them on the day of judgment, listen carefully what the messenger will tell God. Quran chapter 25, verse 30. Check what the messenger will tell God on that day. وَقَالَ الرَّسُولِ يَا رَبِّ إِنَّا قَوْمِ اتَّخَذُوا هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ مَحَجُورًا The messenger will tell God that my people have taken this Quran as abandoned. So if the messenger on the day of judgment will tell God that his people have abandoned the Quran, what makes you think these hypocrites will bring you books today and say these hadith books will guide you? Is it not obvious they have abandoned the Quran and created a new religion? Because Sunnah Islam is a new religion. The prophet was not a Sunni. He doesn't know about any religion called Sunni Islam. He, was, he never claimed to be a Sunni. Quran chapter 27 verse 91 to 92. He said, Then he says, He has been commanded to be of the Muslims and then to recite the Quran. He wasn't commanded to be Ali Sunnah. Do you see? So it is obvious, the moment you tag yourself as a Sunni, you are a mushrik. That is not a religion given to Muhammad. He was instructed to be a Muslim. And what is a Muslim? Somebody who has submitted to the Almighty God. You submit to your creator. That is what makes you a Muslim. You don't need to be a Sunni, a Shia, a whatever, whatever, before you become a Muslim. Do you see the point? Aha, uh -huh. so on the day of judgment, this messenger who will be questioned together with his people, he will come and tell God, my people have taken this Quran as abandoned. So why waste your time listening to the liars who, has, who have never met the prophet, writing books and telling you this is part of Islam. And this is why when the hypocrites, the mushriks, the sectarians, when they watch me, they are biting their hands in rage. I am frustrating them. Yes. Uh -huh, because I'm spoiling their market. They want to just keep fooling the masses. So they hate it that people are starting to wake up and realize that it doesn't make sense. You understand? Uh -huh. So the last advice I have is, 
Quran chapter 17 verse 36 do not pursue that of which you have no knowledge if you don't have knowledge about something don't follow it even if it is coming from the Quran so far as you don't have knowledge about it don't practice it yet study it thoroughly till you have encompassed the knowledge then you pursue it you don't know something in the Quran don't follow it it doesn't mean you don't believe there's a difference between believing and following if you believe something doesn't mean you actually follow it do you see okay ladies and gentlemen that's the phone number that's the whatsapp number below you are free to call if you have any question or if anybody is interested in being on live i can give you the invite he says please how how are we supposed to pray according to the quran uh, as a matter of fact this is a question which was never asked to the messenger because it's not an issue of having difference of uh, way of salat now when we say pray to pray is like you're calling on god invoking god and it's not only limited to a one routine where you say pray, prayer is limited like this you understand now prayer with prayer you have invocation in prayer right invocation is because prayer is communicating with a deity and when you establish the salat you are establishing salat for god it's between you and god so prophet muhammad himself according to the quran chapter 6 verse 162 he says Inna salati wa 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 alamin. so the salat you are establishing it for god to god and again quran chapter 20 verse 14 uh, he says, In, uh, Allah, la ila illa ana, wa akimu salat wa akimu salat He says, Indeed, I am the God, and uh, worship me and establish the salat for my remembrance. So when you establish the salat, it is for the remembrance of God. But it, salat is not only limited to only calling on God. Because Zechariah in Quran chapter 3, verse 38, if you start from 37, 38 to 39, Zechariah used his salat to invoke God. So during his salat, he was invoking God at the same time. Because Quran chapter 2, verse 45, Quran chapter 2, right? Uh -huh. So seeking help in your patient, in your salat, in your salat, you can seek for help. Now, when it comes to the notion of how to perform the salat, we only look at the messengers and the prophets in the past, which the God has given us their examples to follow their footsteps. So, for instance, when you go to Quran chapter 4, verse 102, you will see the prophet leading the salat for the believers. You go to Quran chapter 19, verse 58 to 59, you see the prophets and how they fall down after the verses of God has been recited to them, they fall down in what prostration or submission, and then they, they, they did their salat, right? So now, doing the salat doesn't necessarily mean you have to follow a strict protocol of standing, bowing, and prostrating. We have a notion of standing, from standing you go to prostration, as said in Quran chapter 3, verse 113, right? From the standing position, they went straight to prostration. It can be done. Then from the standing prostration, you can go bowing down before you prostrate, as said in Quran chapter 22, verse 77. It says, Ya you wa jidu wa abdu rabbakum. So arakamu, you can actually bow down is to show another form of uh, like uh, submission to God. Then you go down by prostration. So now, as for having a strict procedure where you say, okay, if somebody prays, that does his prayer and doesn't do this, it's invalid. No, no such thing stated in the Quran. By establishing your salat is to call God, is to remember God frequently. And also salat is meant for God, uh, to be done for God. Uh, uh, Kamal is asking a question. He says, how did our prophet's name ended up in the Shahada and our salams while we praying? These are the concepts from the Hadith books. Throughout the Quran, you will find two Shahadas and this Shahadas has nowhere any room for adding prophet's name there. The Shahadas you find in the Quran, one was in Quran chapter 3 verse 18. And another one was in Quran chapter 37, verse 35. 
ways this one is a shahid allah annahu la ila illa huwa then the other one says wa iza qila lahum la ila illa allah yastakbirun when they are told to say there is no god but allah then they become arrogant so as for the notion of saying ashhadu allah ila illa allah wa ashhadu anna muhammadan abdu wa rasul is wrong because you did not bear witness when he was a messenger you were in there when he became a messenger so quran chapter 4 verse 79 wa arsalnaka lil nas rasulan wa kaffa billahi shahidan god says he has sent muhammad as a messenger to mankind and god is sufficient as a witness so if god is sufficient as a witness who are you to come and say you bear witness that muhammad is a messenger that is why surah al munafiqun chapter 63 verse 1 when the hypocrites when they come to him they say we bear witness that you are the messenger of god and god says they are the liars So if at the time of Muhammad you cannot even bear witness that you are the messenger uh, he is the messenger of God how much more when he is dead why are you going to bear witness for you are a hypocrite for doing that so it's obvious those doing that are hypocrites so it's not part of it do you see and again during the salat when they are performing their prayer you will see them saying assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah and they tell you they are saying salam to the angels who ask you to come and do that is it god no and again When they are doing the salat they call something tayya this tayya they are doing it means greeting greeting who you are coming to greet muhammad yes they are greeting muhammad and which is a form of shirk because salat is only supposed to be dedicated to god now you came in your salat and you say at-tayyatu lillahi was salawatu wat tayyibat assalamu alayka ayyuha an-nabiy wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh that is a shirk because in your salat you are only talking to god throughout and reciting the verses of god and doing the other things but then you left god on the side and you started talking to prophet muhammad even though he's dead and gone but you said assalamu alayka ayyu an nabiy is muhammad in front of you the answer is no he is dead and gone but you are calling him in your salat ask yourself did the prophet call himself in the salat like that obviously common sense is no more common in islam Prophet Muhammad didn't sit in his salat to call himself like that. So if you hypocrites are saying he says sallu kama ra'aytumuni usalli he said you should pray as you have seen him pray did he pray calling himself in his prayer the answer is no you understand so when we say lack of logic this mainstream religions they lack common sense and logic you understand so that's the problem Yeah, salam uh Khalifa Abdul Malik. Uh somebody say difference between ilaha it says laha lahi lahan. When you are reading the Quran, we have something we call uh nasbun, jarun and raf'un. Those are the kasra, fata and dhumma. Sometimes it's kasratain dummatain fatatain used at the end of words in the Quran whether a noun or you know an adjective and so now to understand how the arabic language works i have a long, i have a, 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 a lecture what i did is called the partition between us and the Quran i've addressed these notions why these endings have such scenarios the endings doesn't play that don't play a major role for instance when you take the name muhammad you will find in the quran where it says muhammadun or you have you see muhammadin or you can see muhammadan it doesn't matter it doesn't change the initials of the name itself it's still the name you see allahu allaha allahi is still allah it doesn't change the last ending part is to denote what is continuous after that you understand it's just to show you the morphology of how words are arranged in the quran the structure of the language that what determines but it doesn't change the fact that that now is still a now i hope you understand that fact good hayat says can we make salat in our own language yes we can yes we can yes okay yes assalamu alaikum um, Brother. Brother, quick question in the salat um, just, 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 uh, just a minute just a minute your name and when you are calling from 
Yeah, it's Siraj. I'm calling from UK, London. Uh -huh, okay. Nice to meet you, Siraj. Yes, you can have the yeah. question. Good. Yeah, good to hear from you as well. Yeah, just a quick question. In the Salat, I know we have to recite in Arabic. Can we recite in uh, um, by the tongue as well? Like when we like, recite ayahs, obviously in Arabic, the Quranic ayahs. But if we need to make a like in, in uh, you know make invoke God about some mental stress we might have in our life, whatever, because we can't speak Arabic fluently, I can't. Can I still um to, uh, in like Urdu? say like a, a prayer in that sense Would yeah that acceptable yes in the first place to answer your question in the first place abraham was not an arabian uh musa alayhi salam was not an arabian and so called and so a many a many prophets were not arabians but most of them established the salat as well right so abraham established mm -hmm. the salat he called on god he invoked god the simple answer is there's no restriction saying you cannot call god in any other language you understand? So are yeah. uh, there being a rule where God will say, you can only call me in Arabic language, then we must all abide by that. There, but there's no restriction. So for instance, if you're driving on the road, example, when you're driving and you don't see any speed limits, right? There's no speed limit or the speed limit gives you that recommended speed, say 70, meaning if you go 80, it's still allowed. Recommended is 70, but I can decide to go 80 or 60. I don't need to go way over that uh, speed. Then we have speed limits. When speed limit is set, you see a red sign around that, that limit. When there's a red sign, you don't have to go more than that limit. So that becomes a guilt. So in the Quran, we don't see any notion where God says you can never do Salat in, in any other language. So prophets mm -hmm. established the Salat. They did it in their own language. So then there's no restriction. And actually, the actual like um, the physical of the salat, so we can a minimum do like uh, stand up twice and go down, like you, you mentioned. Like we can stand up, go straight to prostration, and then we can stand up again and then go to the bow position and then go into prostration and then just finish after this. Like, of course, it, it depends on you, the individual. There's no restriction, as I, yeah. I'm saying again. God never restricted anybody and say if you are doing your salat, you cannot do this three times, you cannot do the four times. But I'm saying people mm -hmm. shouldn't take their guidance from external sources where it gives you imposure by giving you a command as to what to do. No. But you are on your own free will. If you are doing salat at home, you can decide to do five times, ten times. That's up to you. It's just like charity. If you are asked to give yeah. charity, let's say I'm one million euro rich, richer than you, and you, maybe you have hundred thousand. Just an example. Just say you have hundred thousand. If we have to give charity, we cannot give equally the same way. I can decide to give mm -hmm. maybe hundred thousand in charity, but what if your limit yeah. is hundred thousand? Can you give hundred thousand? The answer is no. You will decide to give what a ten thousand. So it doesn't restrict mm -hmm. you. There's no restriction mm -hmm. as to doing something mm -hmm. for God. Because remember, the Salat is for God. Quran chapter 6, mm -hmm. verse 162. We are doing it for God. So there's no limit of restrictions there. Yeah. And also, you know, like if, obviously, if there's, if there's times of the day we pray at the both ends of the day, say I was out of my, uh, my neighborhood and I was in the neighborhood where there's a mosque. Obviously, there's a mosque there and it's going to be a better place for me to go inside that mosque to pray you know, on my own. And it, say I saw there's other the group of, you know, um, they're praying in, in a group. Is it good for me to wait till they finish their prayer as a group? And because I'm just going to invoke God myself, so I'm not going to follow their way of what they're doing. And then just uh, you know, whether they finish or I find a security area in the mosque, I can then do my own without joining them. It's still allowed because I'm not following the mushrics, am I? It's not, I don't want to be with them in that sense. Yeah. And also, you should know the basis of the mosque, how the establishment of the mosque. According to Quran chapter 9, verse 107 to 109, you are not supposed to stand in the mosque where there's division. Yeah. If there's division, you can't be there. You understand? Yeah. And if you enter yeah, a mosque, what, yeah, that's why I've understood this because I said, obviously, oh, watching videos and what we know about, we've been brought up in these like these sects. So all of these mosques in the UK, everywhere in the world, you go, it's going to be either following the sect, isn't it? It's going to be we're following the Wahhabi, where this, where Sunnis, etc., etc. So that's my concern. Is like if I leave and go abroad somewhere, or even in my own, own country, even I go to the visit God's house, which is permission given to the kind of visit to the house. What am I supposed to do in the actual uh, in that in, you know the mosque there and then? Are they going to at certain points you know do the zan and do the actual salah? Is it good? It's right for me not to join them at all. And even though you know I don't care what people might be thinking you're with me, uh, why is he not praying with us? I said, look, I'm not concerned with you. I mean, it's for me and God. I'm not going to be what you're doing. You know, that's uncountable on you. So I can still like when they do the big jamaat or you know the the salah as a group when they finished, 
if I find a secluded spot, I can do my own. Would that be sufficient? Okay. Yeah, in the first place, I understand what you meant. But in the first place, always try to ask when a mosque is built around you, ask the foundations of the mosque. Ask what does that who this, does this mosque belong to? It's always good to ask. Okay. Because if they tell you this is a Sunni mosque or a Shia mosque yeah. or a Tijaniya mm -hmm. or Ahmadiyya mosque, it tells you there's a problem, there's a division there. Yeah. But the moment a mosque is established, for instance, this Masjid al Haram, right? It was established yeah. since day one as a masjid for mankind, for Muslims. It doesn't say for Sunnis, yeah. it's not for Shia, it's not for, you understand? Mm -hmm. So in such a masjid, yeah. you can go do your salat and go. But then it, around mm -hmm. you, there is no mm -hmm. restriction in the Quran where God says salat is only meant to be done in the masjid. There is no yeah. such a verse in the Quran. Hmm. Because we found well, I know that it's just that if I'm traveling, like I said, if I was obviously say I'm a city center in the UK, I'm not just it makes sense to have a secluded spot. So there's a mosque nearby, I know basically I can go to that building and pray inside that rather than playing on a bench or on the street where there'd be you know other people onlookers might be looking at thinking, oh, what's this person doing? So I understand you can place it like anywhere, you didn't have to go to a mosque. Like I I have stopped going to my local mosque or Juma Salah with this group because they're either Wahhabi mosque or Sunni mosque. So I know I get more you know, peace at home when I'm, I'm reciting the ayahs and I'm getting more understanding than just like doing a five minute and quick, you know, get onto the, get out of the mosque and, you know, like everyone else does just get onto their normal daily lives. I understand. I understand. Uh, basically, calling on God, if you take Quran chapter 3, verse 38, Zechariah called God in his own sanctum, in you know, his own chamber. Yeah, I'll be uh, just let the one yeah, yeah, by the door. Yeah, yeah. He was he he did he established the salat in his own chamber, right? So yeah. calling yeah. God wherever you are privately is allowed. It doesn't necessarily yeah. have to be in a masjid because Quran doesn't yeah. restrict salat to only in the masjid. You see, uh -huh. so yeah. wherever you are, the convenience you find to do the salat. If you find a space yeah. whereby you can enter privately to call on your God, you are free to do that. Mm. You don't have to actually base it that it has to be in a mosque before you do that. No. Sure. And the quote just before I let just go one more last thing. And exactly like at the certain times of day when God said, you know, invoke him, do the salah, is that possible to, if you couldn't do that for physical prostration, but you're reciting obviously the Quranic ayats in your mind or even uh, aloud, but not too high so I can hear you, but you know at that certain time of day, because in the day now I have to perform at this day because my God told me to, you see. So can, is that possible to allow to do so? If you're driving a car, you can still be on the motorway and still reciting. Because you know it's either sunset or the beginning or the end of the day. Is that allowed? Yes, it is allowed. In Quran chapter 2, verse 238 to 239, God actually says, Hafizu Allah wa salat al wusta wa kumu lillahi qanitin. He said we should yeah. stand for God obediently. But the case is, if what if I cannot stand for God obediently? What happens? Do verse 239 says, If you are in fear, you can do that whilst you are walking. Or whilst you are riding, yeah. the riding rukubanan, yeah, rukubanan yeah. can be in the in the stem of driving, riding a, a yeah. horse animal, being in an aeroplane, being in a sheep. Yeah. Still, is called rukubanan. They are all classified as rukubanan. So God says you can do that whilst you are walking or riding. That is, if you fear in the situation you are in. Yeah. Yes. So it doesn't. Yeah. Salat is not about a, a limit, a restrict. A restriction saying, "Hey, you must stand, bow, yeah. and prostrate yeah. before your salat is accepted." There are conditions. Yeah, yeah, that was my that was my base before. Like I've you know I've changed my ways. Like it says in the Quran, like like local families might see me go another way. And in the Quran, like God mentioned, like a girl, the foolish woman will say that why these people have turned to a different qibla, meaning not qibla like a point facing the car, but like a direction of belief. But then you know the answer because God's guiding me. That's why we've we've gone, we've turned that way. You understand? Exactly. But those are the people who are. The, the, who are the ignorance, they wouldn't understand that because obviously the comments mentioned that they wouldn't have no sense of it. So it was just those things you know, Shaitan's always gonna whisper into our heads when we go this way because we're gonna think, you know, all our lives we brought up this way by our, our parents and you know, a billion Muslims are following this certain way, so it's gotta be right. But like you just in your talk mentioned as well, like if you follow the majority around the world, you're astray anyway, because in Quran says if you follow the majority you know, all the prophets that came, only my minority were believers with those people prophets, you know, the majority always was astray. So it sort of rings the bells and it sort of agrees with that point of mine. Yeah, yeah, uh, I agree with you. Thank you, brother, for for your time. Yeah, let's, thank you, let's give yeah, thank you. I'll speak to other you people. Long, yeah, inshallah. So. Yeah, that that was a caller calling from UK, and he asked his fair share of questions. I think 
Uh, Kamal, Kamal is asking a question. He says, why do the Hadith manias call it Hadith science? What science is applied to it? I wonder, because if in the first place, the Prophet didn't define what Hadith is for them. They define what Hadith is. They will say the sayings, the attributes, and the actions of the Prophet is what they classify as Hadith. Remember, the Quran is Ahsan al-Hadith, the best Hadith. Quran chapter 39, verse 23, Quran is the best Hadith. If you need any Hadith science, Quran is the best science you should study. <laughs> so don't waste your time going to take jumbles of rubbish saying that Hadith science. It's a waste of time. God never gave the Arabs any other book to study apart from the Quran. Quran chapter 34, verse 44. So if you are wasting your time going to learn Hadith science, by the time you finish, you are a dead person already. Uh, let's see what's... Uh, Nas Temi says, Shraib, my question is, is, is said the way you will live your life is written before coming to the world. Why will I be punished if I sin? I am a Christian. I, I Christian asked me, a Christian asked me and I couldn't answer him. It's a simple question. Throughout the Quran, nowhere did God write down and say, whatever you have done, you are going to do in the, your life, huh? How you are going to live your life, he has written it down. He didn't say that. It doesn't exist there any, in any verse in the Quran. If anybody says he says it, let him quote it. Where it says God has already written whatever you are going to do. No, <laughs> it doesn't exist. However, God is Alimul Gaibi wa Shahada. He is the knower of the unseen and the testimony. So God is already aware of what you might act. Not, it's not as if it is written for you to do that. There's a difference between the destiny God has written for us and the difference between what you are going to act on based on your free will. So when we say destiny, stuff like rain, where you'll be born, where you will die, how old you are going to reach, these are all the destinies we are talking about. The misfortunes in life, meaning natural earthquake, disasters, tsunami, these are all part of the destiny we are talking about. But as for what you are going to do, this is why the angels are there recording whatever you are doing so that your records will be submitted on the day of judgment. You understand? Quran chapter 10, verse 44 to verse 45. God is never unjust to the human, human being unless the people are unjust to themselves. So God will never already predict your life and write it down and say, hey, this guy, we have written for him, he's going to... No, no, no. There's no one single verse which says whatever you are going to do, it has, has already been written. No. <laughs> so check Quran chapter 76, start reading from verse 1 to verse 6. It tells you about the human being and how God created the human being. God says he has created you. Wa imma sha, uh, wa imma kafura. He has created you. It's either you are grateful or you are ungrateful. It's your choice. So you decide that is why there is a judgment day. You do good is for yourself. You do bad is for yourself. So why will God now predict, write it down that you are a bad, you are going to be a bad person till you die? No. It's not true. Nazir says, let me see. Nazir NSC is asking a question. He says, please educate us more why women are asked to stop worship Allah while on her period. Well, there's no such thing in the Quran where God says women should stop worshipping God whilst they are on their period. It doesn't exist. So if anybody is telling you that, tell proof to you that verse from the Quran where God says women should stop worshipping God while on their period. <laughs> it doesn't exist. It's not from God, right? Uh-huh. Not, not coming from God. Uh, Amy, Amy Walter is asking a question. She said, Brother Shai, please explain Quran 94 4. Uh, that is verse 4, uh, where God says, Warafana like a zikirak. Like this, your zikirak is something, zikirak, zikra. Uh, zikra in Arabic can mean memory, it can mean reputation, it can mean remembrance. Based on the context being used, if you check the context of the verses, starting from verse 1, it says, did we not expound your bosom for you? It is basing emphasis on the prophet in the entirety of the chapter. Then God says, and we put down your burden away from you. Now God is describing the favor he has done for him. 
which we which had overloaded your back meaning he had a burden upon him and god says and we and raised your reputation for you now this reputation zikrak the reputation of somebody is when somebody's reputation is at stake meaning he has a burden he has problem in his life the moment everything in his life gets rectified his reputation has been built back again so in this context it is referring to the reputation of the prophet if you check from verse 1 coming down so the last verses will give you the hint where he says for inama al usur yusra for indeed with hardship there will be ease then it goes inama al usur yusra indeed with hardship there will be ease so the only way the person can gain his reputation back is after the hardship he has the ease so with the hardship he had the burden god took it away and gave him back his reputation so that is what the verse means chapter 94 verse 4 yeah, thank you, Slamzat. Uh, I have six minutes more to drop the topic. If you have any question, you can actually call or uh, type it down there. Quran chapter 15, verse 10. They ask Muhammad to give them another book or change the Quran. Uh, Hafiz, it is rather Quran chapter 10, verse 15. It's not Quran chapter 15, verse 10. Right, so I hope that is what is you mean, right? It is Quran chapter 10, verse 15. Right, he said he was commanded to follow only Quran, nothing more. Follow hadiths at your peril. Yes, so Quran chapter 10, verse 15. When the verses of God are recited to them as proofs, they, they will say, mm? Then the messenger says, Kul, ma in attabi'u illa ma yuha ilayya. So he, the messenger said, he does not, he cannot change anything by himself spontaneously, but he only follows what is inspired to him by his law, right? Yeah, it's true, Kamal, Kamal, that is true. They distort the messages of the Quran with their whims and desires out there, right? Now, Kusakari, one Nazua, change the same clip, one Nazua. Yakubu Ibrahim, he says, Are you a Muslim or not? And if you are a Muslim, how do you pray? I'm a Muslim and I pray. I have my videos on YouTube. It's there clearly. If you want to know, I give you my YouTube channel. You go to Bush 2G9 on my YouTube. You find but the prayer there. How I pray is there, right? Uh huh. Yeah. I'm done. I'm, I'm going now. Uh, Jeep Joy says, How can I get your PDF translation? Thank you. Uh, Jeep Joy, you see the phone number below this channel. The phone number person that below me, this phone number, that's my WhatsApp number. You can page me, send me a message. I will, I will just send you the PDF copy, right? Uh -huh. The hardcover is still up for grabs. It's available on Natsal uh, Enterprise. You know, it's still up for grab the hardcover. Yes, it's available. You can buy it at a discounted price. Yes, but for the PDF, you are interested, just page me, I'll send it to you for free. Doesn't matter. Yes, I have an I have an email address. Yes, but I prefer when people page me with my phone number on WhatsApp. It makes it easier for me to respond to certain messages and you know, uh huh. Amy Amy Walter is asking a question. He says she. I don't know if it's he or she, but okay. The person says, thanks for the first question. Please, is there anything like writing and drinking of Quran, Quran verses for healing? Uh, there is no such thing, and neither is it haram. If you're doing it, fine. I won't say it's haram. Quran never said it's haram. Can we also use herbs and genes like Prophet Suleiman did 
Uh, the last time I checked, having a relation with the gene, having a friendship with a gene is not haram, right? The gene, some of them are Muslims, and then some of them are Qasitun. If you have a gene who is a Muslim and willing to be friends with you and help you in a good way, that's up to you. There's nothing haram with that. If working with genes is haram, Suleiman will have been banned by God. You understand? So working with genes is never haram. But however, you are not supposed to mingle with the bad ones. Quran chapter 9 verse 119 tells you to be with those who are honest. So if you have a gene who is honest, fine, that's up to you. Yaqub Ibrahim, I think you just got to know me today. This is your first time. So if you want to know me more, you can page me, check my YouTube channel. I have all the answers there. My videos are there. If you're willing to know, you will understand that, right? Mutala Muhammad says, do we have hadith that is authentically from the Holy Prophet Muhammad? No, we don't have such an hadith. There is no hadith. As a matter of fact, apart from the Quran, there is no one authentic hadith which comes from the prophet directly. No, it doesn't exist. They are only based on hearsays. Yeah, Adrana says superstition of people in despair. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I appreciate that, Abu Thomas. Yes, uh -huh. for usually for norm normally for people who buy the hardcover, I do sign. I put my signature on them, right? Uh -huh. To just authorize that I have seen the book and I've signed it myself. So for people who have gotten the uh, hardcover, I've actually signed them, right? Uh -huh. And most of the people, when they receive, they do send me the pictures because they have access to me. So they take the picture, send it to me, and I use it, I put it on my pages sometimes just to show people that, okay, these are the uh, copies people have actually received. For, for the PDF copy, you, you have a direct contact with me, contact me, I can give you for free. But for the hardcover, it's available for grabs on payhip.com or you go to holvi.com slash shop slash natsal. You get it there. And you check on my main page, you see all the links where you can buy a copy and it can be shipped all over the world, wherever you are. And I'm working on how I can get the copies printed in Ghana so that those in Ghana can get it as, as affordable prices and to their own convenience, inshallah. Uh, uh, Michael, uh, Michael, that record, the book of recording is not for God. It's for you to prove to you that whatever you are doing has been recorded. It's just like in this modern day, we have a camera watching you. Look, I'm a salesman. I work in a supermarket. Sometimes a customer will come and argue with me that he didn't do this or he didn't buy this. He didn't take this. What I do is I open the camera and show them the evidence and say, look, here you are. You open here at this time, one o'clock. You came, you took this, you took this, you took that. They don't argue. So God getting the angels to write those records is not for God. It's for you on the day of judgment. The book will be presented to you. Quran chapter 17, verse 13 to 14. Check it for yourself. Quran chapter 17, verse 13 to 14. The book will be presented to you, back to you, for you to see whatever you have done. So it is not God who needs that book from the angels. Uh -huh. Please understand that. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm getting exhausted. I have to go to the shop to buy something for the kids. I'm getting tired. My water is finished. You know, uh -huh. thank you all for those from Ghana, all over the world. I appreciate especially the Ghanaians who are actually paying now attention to the truth being presented to them. I appreciate that. Thank you very much, everybody, for coming once again. I appreciate that. Subhanahu Rabbi. Izzati Amma Isifun. Wassalamu ala al-mursaleen. Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Peace be upon you all, and thank you all once again. Any person, any scholar, sister, says anything, ask for proof. Allah says in Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 111, Qul hatu bunanukum, produce your proof in kuntum sadiqin, but if you're truthful. Any scholar, therefore what I say, that what Dr. Zakir Naik says in Islam is zero. No value. What Allah says, carry weight.